Hello, and welcome to Let's Meet the Virologists, a podcast about the people behind today's science headlines. People just like you working to understand viruses and how they affect you. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we are talking with faculty involved in coronavirus and COVID-19 related research so that you can understand who they are and what they do. I am Larissa Thackeray, and I'm hosting this podcast from America's heartland in St. Louis, Missouri. Today, August 8th, 2020, we have with us Dr. Katherine Holmes, Professor Emerita in the Department of Microbiology at University of Colorado School of Medicine. Kay obtained her PhD in Virology and Cell Biology from Rockefeller University working on influenza and parainfluenza viruses and did postdoctoral training in electron microscopy and cell biology at Harvard University. She studied the structure and function of the coronavirus spike attachment protein, as well as coronavirus pathogenesis in animal models for more than 35 years, and made many fundamental contributions to our understanding of how coronavirus spike glycoproteins interact with their host receptor to initiate infection. On a personal note, from 1987 to 2003, I performed studies looking at what changes in the spike glycoprotein were needed to alter the host range of coronaviruses while pursuing my PhD in Kay's lab. Hi Kay, happy to have you with us today. Tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you become interested in virology? How did you start working on coronaviruses? I was always interested in infectious diseases and I think that was because my father had tuberculosis when I was two years old, which was back in 1942. And there were no drugs and there were no vaccines. And uh, he was away from our family for five years in the hospital with 14 operations, which was all they could do at that time. And ultimately some streptomycin was developed and that turned the corner and he was able to recover and come back to us, which was wonderful. And as he was an engineer, his exposure to me was valuable in encouraging me to think about science. And um, I loved that, but I was deeply impressed with what infectious diseases can do to change a whole family and a whole community. And so in college at Radcliffe and Harvard, I was interested in um, disease and had not thought of becoming a doctor because I didn't have the money to go to medical school. It would not have occurred to me to try even in those days. And, uh, and I had taken a course in virology as an undergraduate and was completely fascinated by virology at that time. And there were a lot of viruses that were um, easy to grow in cell culture, which was developed in the 50s and 60s. And the major childhood viruses, measles, mumps, polio, um, had been developed getting vaccines. And it was such a wonderful thing to see vaccines coming along. And I thought this could be something I would love to contribute to in my life. So I decided to go to graduate school and was interested in virology because it was at such an interesting developmental stage. And I worked in Rockefeller University in New York with Pernell Chopin, and he was interested in influenza and parainfluenza viruses. And I've always had an interest in respiratory viruses. So when I finished working with him and had a degree in virology and cell biology, a mixture, because I was interested in how the same virus, a parent influenza virus called SV5, could cause very different cytopathic effects in two different kinds of cells. And that was interesting to me, the, the interplay between viruses and cells and the specificity with which the virus could do different things to different cells. And they could do this in the body as well. And so I did a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard with Keith Porter in electron microscopy and cell biology. And then when I started my first independent research job at Georgetown University Medical School, I cast about for what should I do? 
what virus should be mine? And I thought, well, I could continue my research and compete with the big labs that were doing influenza and parrot influenza and cell fusion, which was very interesting to me. Or I could find my own virus because there were plenty of them out there in nature that nobody was studying. And a friend, Larry Sturman, um, was working at NIH. And this is a strange story because he was working on trying to identify a virus that was causing um, a scrapie, a disease of sheep. And he was trying to grow that in different cell cultures, one of which was a mouse cell culture. And he got a huge syncytium giant cell formation in the cell line. And he, he was very excited by it and knew I was interested in that. So he gave me some of that to play with. And I, I do always consider laboratory work as playing. So I should admit that right up front. And it turned out that that was not anything like related to what he was trying to study. It was a coronavirus. And it turned out to be mouse hepatitis virus because it came from the mouse cells. And mouse hepatitis virus was a big problem in mouse colonies at that time. The inbred mouse colonies were very susceptible. And so it was a reasonable thing to think about studying that. But it had a human connection, which was deeply interesting to me. And there were two known human coronaviruses at that time. And we knew they caused about maybe 15 or 20% of colds. And nobody was paying any attention to them except a lab in England, which had volunteers who volunteered to be infected. And um, they studied them in that way to see if they could be reinfected with the same virus and so on. And all they could do was actually look at the virus in the electron microscope and see the beautiful big spikes that formed the corona around the virus particle. And since I was an electron microscopist and also virologist and cell biologist, I thought this is a good thing because I've got in my hand a mouse virus with the beautiful spikes and it grows like crazy and it causes fusion, I'm gonna play. And so that's what I did. And I worked with my friend, Larry Sturman. And the thing that was easy to do at that time was a new technique of looking at the proteins of the virus in polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. And you could look at how many proteins there were and what their functions were in the virus infected cell. And so we did that and discovered the interesting functions about the virus spike proteins, which turned out to be one of the main focuses of our work. And we discovered that there was this huge um, spike protein, which is about 200,000 molecular weight, very, very big, one of the biggest of all. And it had a cleavage site right in the middle. And the cleavage into two parts made the virus able to fuse the virus envelope with the host cell membrane and cause infection. And so we became very interested in that process. And that was the beginning of our work. And I would say one more thing, um, which is probably relevant to thinking about my whole career. And that was that I had two little kids at home and I wanted to work on something that I would not bring home as an infectious disease to my family. And so I thought I would like to work on mouse hepatitis virus because I couldn't infect the kids. And I was fascinated by why was it that I couldn't infect the kids with mouse virus? Why was it that the human virus couldn't infect mouse cells? And that was the other focus of the work, to look at host range specificity. Can you describe in more detail your research on coronaviruses? first thing that we did, which I think still has echoes that are happening now with SARS-2, um, was the discovery that uh, furin and trypsin um, could cleave the big spike protein and that the cleavage, uh, if you purified virus particles and you cleave them with trypsin, cleave the spike proteins on them, the virus became very unstable. And importantly, at pH 8 was very, very unstable. 
and we showed that the spike protein underwent a huge conformational change at that, and the virus lost its infectivity because the terminal and terminal domain of the spike protein actually fell off, and there was a conformational change, and we now know that that was what revealed the fusion mechanism. Um, and so we were discovering things like that, which was very interesting and um, was opposite to what had been found at the time with other viruses like alpha viruses, which had the conformation change at acid pH. And there's still nobody looking, as far as I know, at alkaline pH with SARS-2, which I think is very possibly related and could be an important thing to look at with this virus. Um, and and so we, we spent a lot of time looking at the thermostability and the pH stability of the virus and the mechanisms of these conformational changes. And uh, we also became very interested in how the virus infected different kinds of cells. And we looked at different strains of mice and discovered that there was a strain of mice called SJL mice um, that were highly resistant to death from um, mouse hepatitis virus, unlike the other inbred strains of mice, which could be killed. And so we were interested in the genetics of the host that caused the resistance. And we did a very simple experiment where we isolated intestinal membranes, brush border membranes from intestinal cells, and looked at the ability of the virus to bind to those intestinal brush border membranes from susceptible mice and resistant mice and discovered that it wasn't binding to the resistant mice. And that was amazing. And I said, oh, maybe there's a receptor involved. And nobody at the time was doing virus receptors and because cell biology was not at that stage pretty much. And so we then did some um, straightforward experiments to see if we could identify a cell surface receptor. And we made monoclonal antibodies against the cell membranes and found one monoclonal antibody that blocked the receptor on the susceptible cells and prevented infection. And that was cool because then we could precipitate that molecule from that kind of uh, protein from the host cells and find out what it was. And then followed a whole series of experiments on looking at the receptors and uh, collaborating with friends to find out the nature of the receptor virus spike interactions, um, which have been very interesting and, and formed the basis for thinking about how to make a good vaccine against coronaviruses to identify the receptor binding domain and use that to induce antibodies and so on. So that was good. But I want to mention just one more thing, and that was really the importance of friendships in science. And I think that that is something that people who aren't in the field may not understand so well. And the importance of going to meetings and sharing your work with others, as it's just happening, when it's really new and you haven't even published it yet, but you're still at the stage of being really excited about what just happened, and you can tell someone, and if they're excited about it, they may have some other observation that relates to what you do, and there's a collaboration formed. So she can do this, and you can do that, and some new observation is made. And so we were very, very fortunate to be working at the time we were, because we would easily form these friendships and collaborations with people who had other labs that were looking at other aspects of virus research, maybe on a different virus, maybe with a different technique, and they could apply that to our problem or vice versa. And so we had lots and lots of friendships all around the world, actually, for people who were just interested in virus cell interactions. And I call that basic research. We were not doing it to try to discover a cure for something. We were trying to figure out these complex viruses because as the RNA uh, studies became possible and the techniques were developed for that, 
what they discovered was that the length of the RNA genome, genetic information, on a coronavirus was at least like three times bigger than anybody would have ever dreamed. And what was that extra huge amount of RNA? Well, it turns out that it was making a huge RNA synthesizing machine, unlike what any other virus has. And it's still being discovered now and still being analyzed today. And the fact that many people studied that together and separately is the basis for the drugs that people are now using to treat the SARS virus, the SARS-2 virus, and also the SARS virus and the MERS virus that are, are human pathogens. But without basic science, without people who were just studying to understand what the virus was and how it works and what intricacies had been developed during evolution of the virus and how they had changed as it moved from one host to another host and how those receptor jumping steps began to work. Those were tremendously important and they were funded for basic research just for the simple understanding. So when SARS happened, they had a basis to call on scientists who had done the basic research to teach everybody how to think about viruses like that. Otherwise, it would have been much, much more time and it would have taken much longer to solve that first virus problem. To follow up on that, were there any lessons learned from the 2003 SARS epidemic? Well, I think there were some wonderful lessons learned from the first SARS epidemic. And, and the first lesson was that we didn't know about where the viruses were in nature. And we didn't know that coronaviruses were in bats and in many other species. And no money had been assigned to go looking for viruses in the wild. And so some very wise people began to look. First, they looked for the host, the original host for SARS-1. And that took them into looking at all the possible animals, birds, fish, whatever, in China could have been that. And in doing that, they found many SARS-related viruses in different species. And they, a wise group realized that this was important and the relationships between the genetic information in those viruses of different animal species was like an encyclopedia that could teach us an enormous amount about how the viruses interacted with their hosts and moved from one host to another. And so that developed into a big study of viruses in nature, which was wisely funded internationally um, to try to identify what viruses were in nature. And we looked at coronaviruses in bats in Colorado, where I was living at the time, to see if there were SARS-like viruses in the Colorado bats that we could identify with our friends from Colorado State University, mammalogists who routinely were working with those animals. And we indeed did find coronaviruses there, but they were alpha coronaviruses rather than beta coronaviruses like the SARS ones, but they're there. They had plenty of viruses. And there became a big study of how do bats harbor viruses and yet manage to fly around and, and not get sick from them, which has turned out to be extremely interesting and a fascinating story in and of its own, which is being studied elsewhere. I think that um, the ecological studies and the studies on climate change and so on have really pointed out one of the big problems that I think coronavirus people were aware of as soon as we realized the huge reservoir of coronaviruses in bats and other species. And we realized the awful problem that could happen when a coronavirus jumps from a bat to a pig, for example, and they can cause enormous pandemics in pigs. And we've seen that happen again and again. And we realized as coronavirologists what a hazard that was. 
and how you can never predict what will happen when one of these viruses gets into a different host by a few simple mutations of the receptor binding site. And so that and people moving into the areas where the animals that harbor the, say, bat virus, if the bats were always in a separate place from humans, there was not much interchange. But once they start tearing down forests and getting into caves and so on, then there's too much interaction and it is inevitable that a possible interaction could occur and people could become infected. So it looks like for some host jumping events, it only takes one infection of a human to get an epidemic started. And if it happens that that human was in any way immunosuppressed, for example, then that virus would have a chance to grow and maybe adapt very well to growth in humans and then it's off and running. And so it's uh, something that I think coronavirus people realized early and began to worry about a lot. Thinking back over your career, what was the most exciting Eureka moment for you? The receptor. I think the first receptor was the best. And then we, after that, looked for other receptors and found some and began to think about how the viruses had moved and when those things might have occurred and, and why they were different because the receptors are not all homologous from one coronavirus to the next. And that in itself is just fascinating. And they don't always use the same part of the spike protein to bind. Spike protein is uh, like a chameleon. It can use different parts of itself to find something on a cell surface to bind to and then get better and better at it. And that becomes a receptor. These viruses are canny, sneaky, and um, dangerous. Conversely, what is the most difficult thing you've had to overcome as a scientist, and how did you overcome it? I think the most difficult thing was always getting money. I think um, you spend so much of your time at different times in trying to get funding to do the research. And so when I began, I was at a lucky time because NIH was well-funded, and it was possible to say, hey, this is a new virus, it's interesting, potentially different from anything else, we don't know much about it, so let me study it. And I was well-trained and they thought, okay, give her a chance. And I kept finding new things and so I kept getting another chance. And they were funding about that time about 25% of, fun of well-approved grants. And so that was feasible to keep your lab alive at that rate. But then, it came a time when funding really, really dropped and you could only be funded if you were one in the top 9% of approved grants. And that's hard. You had to write a lot more grants in order to get the same amount of money. So instead of spending time with your microscope in your lab and talking to the people and training people more, you're writing more grants, you're writing more grants, you're writing more grants, which is in my mind, a waste of time because I could have been doing more experiments, um, but had to do it. So I think that that was the most frustrating part. Is there a better way to fund science research? It is a difficult problem because one of the biggest problems right now is science has gotten so big so that the tools are very, very expensive. Um, you can make monoclonal antibodies and sort them out and so on, but it takes enormous amounts of money and machines and people to do those things. You can um, sequence huge amounts of things, um, many, many genomes. We couldn't even get a grant to sequence one coronavirus when we really, really, really wanted that data. Um, because it took more time and there weren't machines and the time wasn't right. But um, I think that it should be easier to get funding for people to do smaller things and to allow people to be independent of the huge laboratories. Because what's happening now is that 
one person who is well-funded and trains people well will have a huge laboratory. A lot of people being trained in the laboratory, but when they want to go out and start their own labs, it's very difficult for them to be funded because all the huge laboratories are sucking up all the money. So I think it's hard for people to establish their first laboratories to show what they can do as an independent scientist. Once again, looking back at your career, if you had a chance to tell your younger self one thing, what would it be? Enjoy yourself. Science is the best thing ever. And I think, I think every experiment is a treat. And um, there is nothing more wonderful than seeing something for the first time and sharing that with the people in your lab, I guess is the second thing. But to have the privilege of having the tools to do an experiment and then, and then actually seeing something from nature that no one ever knew is enormously wonderful. And, um, and then, of course, it doesn't work unless you can write and share it and tell other people about it and see what it means and go on from there because every new discovery leads to a thousand new questions and that's fun too. Uh, so I think, I think that the network of people has been a delight in my career. And the people include not only my colleagues that I talk to around the world for the science part, but also the people who came through my lab, like yourself, and were a very important part of all the fun of the labs. Because I always thought that the people in the labs were the equal product as well as the research. The people and the research were equal. And I hope that remains true today in all the labs. More personally, how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected you as an individual? Well, I retired um, formally in 2010 and spent the next five years trying to develop a universal influenza vaccine in a small company that we had developed and then um, physically retired from laboratory work in uh, 2015 when we moved to Washington State. And uh, as a professor emerita, I just keep up with coronavirus research and progress and enjoy learning about everything that's happening, which is becoming very challenging because it's happening so fast and there's so much research going on so fast. But um, the coronavirus epidemic actually in the United States began near Issaquah, which is where we live. And Kirkland was where the um, outbreak first was in a nursing home. And we live in a retirement community of 500 people. And so these people who are in independent living apartments and so on, still meet every day and are prime targets because we're all older and retired with whatever kind of age restrictions and comorbidities people might have. We're prime targets for this virus and still very active about in the community and doing all sorts of things. So my goal in this last part of this year has been to try to keep the virus out of our community. And we have lots and lots of committees trying to encourage use of masks and hand washing and distancing and understanding where the virus may be and so on. And it is indeed a real challenge. It is a real challenge because you can see what the danger might be. And we've been really lucky to be in Washington state because as soon as it was realized what was going on, the state, Governor Inslee, and the wonderful public health people here really did shut down the state. And so it didn't get as bad as it could have elsewhere. As a virologist, how do you make decisions about how to keep yourself, your family, and your community safe? We use Zoom. We don't move around in the community much at all because it's not very safe. And um, so we use Zoom a lot and we stay within the community here, masked and careful and so on. And um, we do a lot of Zoom work here. 
and uh, we don't have groups bigger than five and we don't have meals together anymore here. It's been a complete change in culture here. It's very difficult, very difficult. But highly motivated people and highly intelligent people, and they're all working hard to do it, but it's hard. During the COVID-19 pandemic, have you picked up any new hobbies? I would say coronavirus is my total hobby. As we wrap up our podcast for today, any messages for our listeners? Any thoughts about the future of the COVID-19 pandemic? I think it takes a concerted plan, which we don't have. I think we have a good understanding of what is needed, but that we're going to have to step back before we can step forward. And that I'm hopeful that the drugs and therapeutics will be developed in sufficient amounts to make the virus less deadly for its particular target audiences before probably the vaccines become available on a wide enough scale to protect us and let us go out and about in our community with impunity as we wish we could. Thank you, Kay, for talking with us today about yourself and your research. Kay believes that friendship, sharing, and collaboration allowed her and others in the field to carry out important basic scientific research about coronaviruses that has laid the foundation for our efforts to find therapeutics and vaccines for these viruses today. These studies also revealed that coronaviruses are everywhere and due to their highly adaptable spike glycoprotein are readily able to cross over from animals to humans. This has been Let's Meet the Virologists, a podcast about people who study viruses. This is your host, Larissa Thackray, and thanks for listening. You can find us at lmtv.podbean.com to leave a comment about this podcast or to tune in to another podcast. If you are a virologist interested in sharing who you are and what you do, please contact us at letusmeetthevirologists at gmail.com.